Joining us now, first here on CNBC, fresh from that G20 meeting and North Korea, Director of the White House Trade and Manufacturing Council, Peter Navarro. Welcome back, Peter. Nice to have you. Great trip, and it's good to be home. Yeah, how would you characterize the progress that you made specifically on those trade talks with Xi? Well, we're uh, re-engaged. Uh, we're talking on the phone already. There will probably be visits. Uh, it's all good. Uh, I think uh, it was a pause that was necessary at the time, but uh, this is very bullish for the markets, uh, lower uncertainty in terms of the whole thing. Uh, we're headed in a very good direction. Except for we've been here before. We saw a trade truce after the last G20 meeting. That didn't stick. Why should this time be different? So this is a very complicated process. Uh, there's seven different moving parts. We had a deal that was over 150 pages long with seven different chapters. That's the basis now for moving further forward. Uh, it's complicated, as the president said correctly. Uh, this will take time, and we want to get it right. So let's get it right. In the meantime, uh, in terms of the markets, I think it's very bullish for the markets. And, and the two things that really have to happen in the short run to get us Dow 30,000 and above are going to be passing the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement and uh, having the Fed uh, lower interest rates. Uh, Mr. Navarro, there are those who say, well, you know, we've got talks back on track, but we actually gave some things up, namely Huawei, for example, uh, and got nothing in return for actually getting those talks back on track. What do you say to those critics who sort of wonder about that negotiating leverage that we potentially did not use? Well, there, there's a couple of things there. I think what's important about this negotiation is the close personal chemistry uh, between President Xi and President Trump. Uh, President Xi uh, requested some relief on Huawei. Uh, here's the important thing. Uh, U.S. policy on Huawei with respect to 5G in this country has not changed. Uh, that will not happen with Huawei in this country. Uh, all we've done, basically, is to allow uh, the sale um, of chips uh, to Huawei, uh, and these are lower-tech uh, items which do not impact national security whatsoever. Huawei remains on the entity list. But more importantly, I think uh, China gave us some things, too. They promised immediate and significant uh, agricultural purchases, and we hope to see immediate, immediate progress on that. Uh, the important thing here is Huawei is small in the scheme of things. Uh, the important thing here is negotiations are back on track. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer is actively engaged with, with President Trump uh, guiding the whole process. And I think the market should be very happy about that. Yeah, and well, the market was happy yesterday, certainly. But, you know, you, you talk about Huawei being small in the scheme of things, which I guess I can understand. But no, at the no, same let time, me be, let, me I, be clear, let me be clear here. Well, you just said Huawei, that. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, what okay. I, Huawei <laughs> selling chips to Huawei, a right. small amount of chips, less than a billion dollars worth of chips a year, uh, in the short run uh, is small okay. in the scheme of things. 5G, uh, the fight for 5G, President Trump is very committed uh, to having the U.S. take the lead on 5G, uh, building uh, companies like Nokia and Ericsson up uh, in Europe that will contribute to that process. So 5G is huge. Uh, selling right. a few chips to Huawei is not. Okay, that's, I mean, I guess people are still, and, and some of the companies still trying to understand exactly where we stand with that because we have characterized them as a national security concern. I mean, you said on and, our and air, we have There's the bright no light shown on Huawei, which is a very bad actor in yeah. the international arena. So that continues then. I should not take yeah. this as sort of a, a green light for Huawei in any real way, just sort of a, what, a, 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 an a olive branch to some extent to sort of help the Chinese at least think that we're going to help keep them in business? Yeah, I think you probably said it better than I, I could. Uh, I think the thing here, I mean, if you talk, think about the Huawei, okay, there's two things going on. One is Huawei is trying to dominate uh, 5G using the usual Chinese playbook, which is to, to dump product below cost, steal the technology from their rivals, and push everybody out. The problem, of course, David, uh, is that you got software issues, uh, you want one patch, and you can open somebody's uh, system to Huawei. Uh, you got hardware problems. Uh, there can be Trojans lurking. So we have to be very uh, clear about that. And we're going to work closely with our allies around the world to make sure uh, Huawei 5G is not in those countries. But in the meantime, 
a small amount of low level chips are going to be sold uh, to keep uh, systems going uh, and that's that's not a bad thing uh, when it gets us back to the bargaining table with China and with China committing to immediate and significant purchases of agricultural goods and let's see if they deliver on that. You know, the administration also decided to hold off on the additional tariffs, that threat that was hanging over of the $300 billion in imports. It, it all feels very un-Peter Navarro-like. Were you on board with how this went down? Totally on board. Uh, look, we have 25 percent tariffs on $250 billion worth of Chinese products. That's our insurance policy uh, to keep uh, these negotiations on track. It's also our defense against Chinese predation. And we know what they do. They steal our intellectual property. They force the technology transfer. Uh, they dump products into their markets. These are the structural issues that we're dealing with, not just for the United States of America, but for the rest of the world. I mean, what we're, what we're trying to get to is a place with China that it conforms uh, to the rules of international trade as we know them, not as they know them, because the rules that they follow uh, are ones that it's more of a, a zero-sum game. Uh, we want to move beyond that. But look, from an investor's point of view, here's all you have to know. Talks are back on track uh, with the uh, work that has been to, done to date, the 150-page-plus document that serves as a way to move forward from there. There's a lot of good work that has been done. You've got the best U.S. trade representative we've ever had in the U.S., and Bob Lighthizer, uh, and he's working closely with President Trump, who's actively engaged in all of this. And so we have a plan. I think people need to be patient. As the president said, he wants to get this right. These things take time. And this deal, by the way, is far more complex than anything we've ever negotiated, including the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which is the most sophisticated and smartest deal ever written. So um, we got a lot of good work to do, but we're doing it. And I think the market should be happy about that. Investors should be happy about it. One thing that investors aren't too happy with is that growth is slowing, and there's some real evidence that the tariffs are having an impact, at least on the manufacturing. I mean, you have to admit that, Peter. We've seen a, a softness in the numbers and the new orders and the regional Fed manufacturing surveys. Is there some recognition within the White House that you need to speed up on the so, deal to prevent the economy from losing more so, speed, uh, steam? So I don't have to admit that at all. I, you know, all I have to do is point to the Federal Reserve uh, hiking interest rates unnecessarily too fast, too far, and engaging in, in massive quantitative tightening at a time uh, when they should have been holding, holding uh, pat. And, and that, what we're feeling now is kind of the, the residual effect of that mistake that was done months ago. And the hope is that uh, the Fed will do the right thing here and lower interest rates and get us back on track. But the tariffs uh, in my judgment, are working beautifully. If you look at Q1 uh, 2019, we had a 3.1 percent GDP growth rate, and one point of that, fully one point of that, was attributable to a reduction in the trade deficit, primarily with the tariffs on China. And China's paying the tariffs. The Chinese producers pay the tariffs in the form of lower exports, lower prices, and lower profits. The Chinese government right. pays the tariffs. Uh, in terms of a lower growth rate there, there and higher uh, unemployment. Peter, are we really going to have this argument again between the two of us about who pays? I mean, we've had a yeah, series of CEOs come on this air. Well, see, they, look, we have so these David, CEOs that come David, on our David, air, David. Peter, all the time who say, I don't know how I'm going to pass it along, certainly if it went so, to 25. So I don't David, know. I, I'm going to swallow David, some of the if, margin. If you're a yes. CEO, hang on, if you're a CEO, yeah, I'll listen. you're going to come on and you're going to say whatever it is that it's going to advance your multinational model to offshore products to China. That's what you do. And if uh, the day you start believing what, what chief executive officers say uh, is the day that you've fallen into <laughs> well, the deep swamp, buddy, okay, and I'll right. send you a snorkel. I, I, I've been doing <laughs> this a long time. You know I, and that. so have yeah, I. And sometimes and I, you I believe know, them and sometimes I don't. All right. Well, don't um, believe them in this point because uh, the problem is, look, he, the, here's the difference. This is not a tariff on the rest of the world. It's a tariff on China. What we're seeing is uh, all this production move either here or to Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand. Uh, China did, by the way, uh, devalue its currency by 10 percent to offset the 10 percent tariffs on that $200 billion. So, And we're seeing zero inflation. I mean, point me to this inflation, David, that's supposed to exist from the tariffs. You cannot find it.
No, well, because like you guys haven't, pun. you've spared a lot of the consumer companies so far. I mean, go through with that next $300 billion and you well, that's see another it, right, that's another discussion in another segment. Uh, but uh, for now, I thank you for admitting okay. that the first 250 billion have had zero effect on inflation, and China's paying the tariffs. You made my argument. QED. Uh, China's Beautiful. not paying the tariffs. <laughs> no, she, uh, she just said yeah. it. Uh, no, well, I, I, she no, said no, there I, was zero I, I inflation. Was Somebody's got to be paying for it. It's not well, us. It's not American well, inflation consumers. Inflation has been soft, but, but that's because you guys have spared apparel and footwear and some of the equipment that. Consumers do pay for iPhones. All right. Well, um, like I say, let's have that conversation if right. and when uh, the president you know, uh, decides to raise the tariffs on the last uh, what we call uh, the fourth tranche uh, of right. Chinese products. But remember what we're fighting for. I mean, look, you and I we do. We, agree. We, we agree. Know. We agree. Right. We agree that China basically needs to clean up its act big time and that they've had 15 years over the course there of is, uh, Biden there is and little Bush doubt and back there's, to Clinton. And there's, Yes, and this, my guy is the guy who's standing almost. up for the American people. Peter, so we all agree we, on we, that. It, I uh, certainly hear it from a lot of business leaders who are supportive of the efforts you're making here. I guess I'd like to get to that, back to the sort of the sure. issue at hand. I mean, uh, Secretary Mnuchin has talked about, well, we were 90 percent of the way there. But that 10 percent, where we do we still want the Chinese to commit to legislation that enshrines some of these things we want so, them to do on intellectual property, on any number, on, on, on technology transfers, because they seem to be pretty set, dead set against doing that. So uh, I'm not going to uh, infringe upon uh, Robert Lighthizer's territory as a trade rep. I'm going to let him do the negotiations behind closed doors. And when the time comes, uh, the big reveal uh, will happen, and I'll be here to talk about what exactly happened. Uh, but before Should then, we... let's let the negotiations go. I think that's what the important right. thing is. Let's have the negotiations done uh, soberly, quietly, behind closed doors, and then all will be transparent uh, when the time comes. We need to get uh, to, to a deal, and it'll either be a great deal or it won't. Uh, that's President Trump's words, and uh, he's our leader on this. And look, I mean, the other thing we should agree on is before President Trump uh, took office, we spent over a decade where nobody even bothered to challenge the Chinese on their unfair trade practices, and now we have them at the table, at the table. No, That's we do, good. Uh, but That's I good. guess the concern among some is that to the extent that we've got them there, that we really can follow through and actually get the meaningful changes, Well, well the we're systemic working, changes we're, we're that working people towards want. It. You guys um, always uh, want more. That's the problem, David. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's what we're life's working about. on it. Come on. Yeah, that's what indeed. Life's about. Yes, we only get more. one shot at it, Peter. Well, that's you right. Have well, more, well, we're right? working on it, and uh, nobody. I mean, look, coming back from the G20 and the DMZ, uh, who could have imagined uh, the kind of progress uh, that was made? I mean, look, I, I was in a lot of those bilateral meetings at the G20, and every single one, I saw the president with his unique brand of personal warm diplomacy, having good relations uh, with leaders across the political spectrum, advancing American economic and national security right. interests. I mean, to be able to call Saudi Arabia any time the price of oil spikes and say, hey, help us out, pump some more oil, uh, that's, that's a good thing. Those are the kinds of things. If, to be able to call a Turkish president and pre prevent him from killing tens of thousands of Kurds in Syria. That's a good thing. This is, this is what this president does. I, I would say, uh, in my judgment, this is the best foreign policy president since Reagan uh, by a long shot. I mean, it particularly, I mean, the, the walk uh, scene around the world, the handshake scene around the world across the DMZ. I mean, that man was bold. I mean, he walked over there without an entourage of security guards right into North Korea. Who would have the chutzpah to do that, David? Uh, well, uh, we can discuss that part of it, but really what I like talking to you about is more of uh, the focus of your uh, efforts and certainly Indeed. what you've written a lot of books about, Peter. Well, was that Let part me... of it? Was, was the North Korea meeting part of the trade talks at all between the U.S. and China? Uh, no, I, I think what's important uh, about the North Korea issue is that if President Trump weren't in office, We'd likely see the, the soil of North Korea rocking with nuclear tests. We'd likely see missiles going over Japan and Korea, getting ever closer to the United States of America. And instead, we have an era of calm uh, on the Korean Peninsula, which, again, from an investor's point of view, world market's point of view, uh, that's very bullish. 
Uh, so uh, you know, kudos to the president for pulling off foreign policy like that. And one of the things I do at the well, White House it's, is, it's is not leave. a done deal. It's, of course yeah, not. It's not of a course done not, deal, but, Peter, in but, any way, shape, or form. But, but let me say this. I mean, one of the one of the things I do at the White House is weave together this whole idea that economic security is national security, so that when we sell um, a THAAD system to the Saudis, that helps stabilize the Middle East, but it also creates tens of thousands of jobs across over 40 states in the United States. And so uh, you know, this whole um, negotiation with North Korea uh, is, again, stabilizing and allows the world economy to grow. I get it. Uh, I get not it. under the um, cloud of nuclear uh, holocaust. You know, I can't help think back to Huawei, though, when you talk national security and, and, uh, and trade. Small amount and, of chips, David. Economic, Small amount of chips. But 5G, which you raised earlier, I mean, you can say all you want about it, but there are many people who think we're not in the lead, that regardless the Chinese are, they're investing a great deal more, that Huawei is the leader there and conceivably around the world will be, and that we're behind. I mean, you even mentioned Ericsson and Nokia. They're not U.S. companies, Peter. Well, uh, this is funny that you say that because we're always being criticized for not uh, engaging in alliances around the world. And with 5G, I think that's going to be the poster child for working with Europe, with working uh, with Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, um, in getting uh, to be first in 5G uh, as, a, as a world with Europe and, and our allies in Asia. So uh, Nokia and Ericsson are important to that, and we have a lot of American companies uh, that, that will be part of that. Uh, the important thing is, is to dominate that space, and we're working on it. And remember, yes. you know, the whole China game plan, um, the China 2025, is to dominate not just 5G, but uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology. Uh, and we can't let that happen. President Trump uh, is, is a visionary on this, and he's, he's put his foot down, and we're going to make sure uh, that the U.S. is the innovation leader. And more importantly, after we innovate, we keep our technology and our IP. How badly do you need to make this deal before the election? I, look, the president doesn't do things uh, with the idea towards the election. That's one of the things I admire about him. He does the right thing for the American people. So we're going to get a deal that's a great deal for America. We're not going to sacrifice anything in order to get a, a, a cheap political trick. Uh, and I, I, I love this guy for that. I mean, he, I see this every day uh, when, when, if I'm with him. And it's just, it's just a great thing. He truly cares about the American people, the men and women, particularly those who work with their hands in our factories and on our farms. Uh, and he's going to do the right thing here. What about the, uh, the new tariffs that you guys are, are putting out there threatening for Europe on the, the Boeing aircraft WTO decision? Can Europe expect a harder line? Should Europe expect a harder line from the U.S. now as it relates to tariffs, possibly the auto import tariffs and another sort of more aggressive measures so so just just for your viewers this is a hard shift okay we're going over to a completely different topic so just as a little bit of background there was a case at the wto uh against um, europe for heavily subsidizing airbus uh and working within the wto we were able to get a favorable judgment on that and as we speak uh, the United States Trade Representative's office is working on what uh, what our relief might be, which would be in the form of tariffs. So again, let's let that play out. I think um, Ambassador Lighthizer's uh, will have some announcement on that in the coming weeks. Uh, but uh, you know, look, Boeing <laughs> is a very important part of the Dow. By the way, um, it's being uh, harmed materially by heavy subsidies to Airbus. And uh, we stood up for uh, Boeing on that, and we'll see what happens. The idea, uh, what we're always seeking is to get fair and reciprocal trade uh, without heavy subsidies from foreign governments to take our jobs, and that's the mission here as well. Um, Can, Peter, can't disagree with that. I mean, that's, I mean we, we need to... No. We need no. to do it that. Strikes me, it strikes me that you said that the market could get, the Dow could get to 30,000 if the Fed lowers interest rates and the U.S. can pass the U.S. MCA. So you don't think that the market is hanging on this China trade deal? I think, I think uh, the market uh, should be taking comfort now from the fact that we're moving from the, from the China trade deal. But in the short run, uh, the best thing to do to get the market up is to cut interest rates. 
and pass the USMCA, which should be passed this summer. I have a little bit of credibility here. The day after the election, I don't know if you remember this, uh, but I was on CNBC on Squawk, and the futures were like dead, dead down red. Uh, and I described how we would get to Dow 25,000 on the basis of tax cuts, deregulation, cheaper energy, and a level playing field on trade. And uh, I, besides the president, I think I was the only one in the world who predicted that. Uh, and um, I just got lucky on that, I guess. Or President Trump's a great president on the economy. You take, you take your choice there. Yeah, well, I know how you feel about it, for sure. <laughs> even with Thank the Fed you. tightening. You got there even with the Fed tightening. Which is why you think. Yeah, that well, he weekend. threw us a, a, a Jay Powell threw us. A, a, I don't know if it's a curveball or a, a, a fastball at the head, but that that cost us a half to one full point of growth. Uh, but we can get that back if the Fed does the right thing. Uh, and look, the U.S. Mexico Canada agreement um, is ready to ready to go. Uh, we just need to get uh, a, a final negotiation with the Democrats. On, on Capitol Hill on, a, on, a, on enforcement issues, and let's get that passed. Uh, if it gets to the floor, it'll pass overwhelmingly with a bipartisan vote. Uh, it'll get us an additional more than a GDP growth point, half a million jobs, uh, 75,000 jobs in the auto sector. I mean, it is, it is a beautiful thing when it comes to economic stimulus and bringing jobs home uh, with things like rules of origin, uh, in it. So uh, let's get that done. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't get that done other than petty politics. And I don't think, I think that, I think Capitol Hill is going to do the right thing on this. I don't say that very often, but I think on this one, uh, because of the stakes involved uh, across every single state in the union, uh, I think they're going to do the right thing and they'll do it this summer. And we'll get the Dow on the thir at 30,000. And I'll sit in this chair when that happens. Uh, and we'll we'll uh, we'll party like it's uh, 2020. There you go. Keep All us right. posted on the progress, Peter. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure.